that I want to use. One of them is found in 1 Kings 8, verse 27. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house which I have built. The reason the heaven of heavens can't contain God is because God is not contained. God contains. Then there's another verse, Psalm 147, 5. Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. Now I'd like you to indulge me in a moment of prayer, if you will, before we attempt to preach. Now, our Father, who art in heaven, we pray that thy name may be hallowed tonight. We pray that this may not be an exhibition of verbal skill. We pray that it might not be a demonstration of logic. We pray that it might not be an exhibition of godliness. We pray, rather, that thy name may be glorified in heaven and in earth, and that we may decrease and thou mayest increase. O oh Lord, we pray, help us tonight. Thou knowest there's a chilliness on us, chilliness on the place. And we pray that thou wilt give us a sense of thy presence that will warm our spirits. We take so much for granted and we get so used to things. Great God, how we need the glory to be revealed. Reveal thy glory, O God, to us. And we'll... We'll try to respond in a manner worthy of thee. If not worthy of thee, then worthy of us. And to thee shall be the glory and the praise. Amen. <clears throat> now, I have been following a method. It is not to talk down to anybody. I think it is an evidence of considerable degree of conceit for a man ever to talk down to anybody. Who knows who's up and who's down? There may be young fellows here with their ears standing out like taxi cab doors standing open that has so many brains that it make me look as if my skull was hollow by comparison. You don't know it yet, but they'll come out. So why should I talk down to a fellow like that? Or to anybody for that matter? So I'm going tonight to do something that I have never known of anybody's doing, anytime, anywhere. I've never read a book on this subject in my life. There are a little paragraph here and there in the books on systematic theology, but they hurry over. I want to talk on the infinitude of God. And this, above all other truths that I'll be discussing this week, will be deep and hard to understand. And it will make more demands upon our intelligence than any other truth that I'll discuss. It will make more demands upon our imagination and our power of abstract reasoning than any other truth, probably than any other doctrine, unless it be the doctrine of the Trinity. And that's more confusing than, than profound. But this is... This is profound to a degree that you're going to have to shake your head and wake your mind and think a bit. Now, the reason is that um, we're going to ask you to try to picture a mode of being to project out of your mind or onto the screen in front of you somehow, a mode of being wholly different from anything you know anything about. You know, we always reason from the familiar to the unfamiliar. We say this was like that. They called the automobile the horseless carriage when it first came out because it was a carriage that didn't have a horse. That's pretty plain. And uh, they couldn't quite jump 
to uh, where we are now in their imagination, so they went slowly, horseless carriage. You'll find many words. You'll find this doctrine embedded in the language, in the English language, and I suppose most every other language too, if not all. The, uh, the inability to uh, conceive of anything unfamiliar without first laying a hold of something familiar and using that as raw material to think with, that's embedded in our language. And when I talk about the infinitude of God, that is that God is infinite, it requires that I pull loose from anything I know and that I go out on my own, that I make a leap of faith and hope for the best because, you see, God is not like matter. We can describe one kind of matter by another kind of matter. You can say it's like. And I've always been pleased with uh, the book of Ezekiel, how when the man of God was trying to explain what he was seeing, he didn't have any language to explain it with. And so he fell back on like images. He said it was like a throne, and it was it was like, and it was as the appearance of. But he never quite said it was. He didn't say it was, he just said it's like, the appearance of, and the likeness of. And he kept tossing those words around, trying to express that which can't be expressed by use of language that we can understand. And when you come to the being of God, you've got to do this all the time, or else keep still, and not try to think at all. We uh, talk about space. We've entered the space age. Used to be the only space we knew about was a distance from the house to the barn, across the county seat. But now it's way out yonder, way out there. But when you think about God, you've got to rule space out because God does not dwell in space. Space dwells in God. And when you think about God, you have to rule time out. I know the Bible calls him, God calls himself the ancient of days. He does that because he knows you and I have minds that have to have help. So he, he comes down and adapts himself to our limited knowledge. God is not like any creature, and he's, li he's not like matter, and he's not like motion, and he's not like energy, and he's not like law, and he's not, not like anything you're familiar with. And therefore, when you try to picture God forth and visualize God, particularly when you try to visualize the infinitude of God, you find yourself stuck. Yeah, to a degree, I hope that we'll get along all right. But the idea of limitlessness is what I want to talk about tonight. The God is infinite. Now, one thing we've got to keep in mind, I repeat, that everything I say and all I say, we're still, it's still not God. It's only that which we can know about God. I repeat that it's possible to know about and not know. I know about Abraham Lincoln, but I don't know Abraham Lincoln. I know about Khrushchev, but I don't know Khrushchev, and I don't want to, but uh, I don't know him, you see. His wife knows him. She knows him. No doubt she pats his old bald head and uh, says, Honey, would you have two lumps or one? He's a human, I suppose. So uh, we'll let it rest at that. But uh, she knows him. I don't know him. I only know about him. I don't know Eisenhower. I like him. I, 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 I have an affection for the old gentleman, uh, as you do, the fine old gentleman, general and president now. But I don't know him. I, I don't know him. I've never experienced him. I can know about him. I could read his life if somebody writes it. And thus, I could know about him. I could lecture on him if I'd read up, you know, bone up on... Eisenhower, the general Eisenhower, the statesman, Eisenhower, the golfer, Eisenhower, the husband. I could write a book about it if I just bone up on Eisenhower and still never have met Eisenhower and never know him at all. So it's possible to know all that I'm going to tell you tonight and not know God. It's possible to know all that I'm going to tell you all week and still not know God. Because, as I repeat, God is not known by uh, breaking down what can be known about him uh, and getting it inside our head, God is known by spiritual experience. God is known experientially, or he isn't known at all. John 17, 3 says that this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the ever or the uh, Father, and uh, him, the Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Now, know there doesn't mean know about. It means experience. 
this is eternal life, that they might have, uh, have spiritual intercourse, spiritual communion, that they might know experientially God the Father and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. So that uh, theology is that which we can know about God. But revivals, while they must spring out of theology, you can have all the theology in the Bible and not have a revival. And you can have a revival and not have too much theology because God isn't as careful nor as concerned about our heads as we are. He's more concerned about that personal experience of which I'm speaking. Now let's look at this thought that God is infinite. And we know this from the scriptures as one of the things which God has declared to be true about himself. We also know by revelation, by reason I mean, a confirmation of revelation, not that revelation, if it's divinely inspired, needs to be confirmed, but because we have heads on our shoulders and we have to think a little, uh, it's at least an intellectual comfort to have intellectual confirmation of a spiritual fact. Otherwise, we might wonder whether we might not have simply been off the track a little bit. But when it's revealed in the Bible and human reason kneels and adores before it and admits the logic and truth of it, then the whole man is blessed. That God is infinite, I say, is found in the scripture. Now, what does that mean? It means that God knows no limit, no bound, no end. I'll be talking sometime this week about the negative theology, that is, the, uh, the theology uh, of the negative. There are those who say, and the wise old, uh, the old mystic theologians of other days, they said that that was the best way to know God, to know what he wasn't, and that if you were, you, you were picturing what he was, then you weren't picturing him at all. If you can picture it, it isn't God. That was one of the rules of the old philosophers of other days, but you and I try to pay. I wish that I wish that Michelangelo had seen that and had learned that, and that he hadn't painted God as a bald-headed old man with a fiery finger. You ever seen that picture? I think it's absolutely horrible. I don't believe in any picture of God, and I don't even believe in any picture of Christ. <clears throat> Though, because Christ became man and dwelt among us, I'll not push that point. I only know that uh, there is no authentic photograph of Jesus Christ, there's no sketch of Jesus Christ, there's no painting of Jesus Christ, and all you're looking at when you look at a picture of Jesus is the inside of some man's head. And when you look at Solomon's famous, now famous, picture of Christ, all you're looking at is the inside of Solomon's head. You're not looking at the face of Christ at all, because nobody knows what Christ looked like. They haven't a remote idea what he looked like. So I don't believe in pictures. I, I believe that we ought never to paint pictures of God. I say I would not press it that we should not have pictures of Christ, though personally I won't have one around the house. I don't want to picture Jesus as being the way some artist thought he was and then be disappointed when I see him as he is. You know, we've seen him with a, with a crook in one hand and a lamb under his arm so long that some Christians will be disappointed when he comes down to meet us if he doesn't have a little lamb under his arm, because they, the artists have painted him like that. That's not God, and that's not even Christ. <clears throat> but I think that it is bordering on blasphemy to try to paint the, uh, the Almighty God as Michelangelo and some of the others have done. God has no limit, now I say. Whatever God is, he is without limit, and all that God is, he is without limit. That's very difficult for you and me to grasp because limit is what we have lots of. You students know about that when it comes to finances. Limit is that which you are have the most plentifully. And uh, limit as to, uh, as to ability. When you come to take your test, you'll find that out. That uh, you know that, among other things, you have limitations. But uh, because there's always a limitation somewhere... Then when we try to think away where limitation doesn't exist, we find ourselves staggering, fluttering about, and trying to land on something with nothing to land on. Now, God has no limits, and we cannot think of any limit, whatever, any bound, uh, any end to God Almighty. And here, you see, we've got to eliminate all po popular usages of words like limited and bound and infinite and so on. That's one of the problems we have. It's a real problem. When we come to talk about God, we find we've used up all the good words, and there's nothing left to talk about God with. 
woman talks about a, 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 a dress being divine. And then what's the preacher going to call God if a woman makes out a miserable dress to be divine? And uh, a girl says, oh, I met Ed last night. He's just marvelous. Well, how are you going to sing about a marvelous Christ when you've already used up the word marvelous on a guy who needs a shave? And uh, where, where are we going to go for words? We've used up all our good words. We talk about unlimited wealth. We say the United States has unlimited wealth. I know it has a lot of it because I have personally helped to pay it. But um, uh, unlimited wealth, well, that's nonsense. There's no such thing as unlimited wealth. Even the gold over in Lexier, Louisville, Kentucky, over in Fort Knox, it's limited. It's getting more so all the time, they tell me, they're shipping it overseas to our loving brethren beyond the bounding Maine. And uh, we're, we're getting more limited all the time. So when we talk about unlimited wealth, we're using words in a very relative and popular sense, for there's no such thing as unlimited wealth. They said Henry Ford never knew how much he was worth, but uh, of course uh, that merely means that he was a good, me- a good mechanic, but uh, a, a very poor, uh, a very poor uh, financier. He couldn't, he didn't know how much money he had. And so they said, well, it was unlimited. No, no, it wasn't unlimited. You just give him three or four Playboy heirs and they'll use it all up in one generation. Never limited. And we talk about boundless energy. Say, that boy has boundless energy. Well, you know that isn't true. There's a bound to the energy, all right. The little seven-year-old, you say, oh, his energy is boundless. But wait till about eight o'clock at night. And he's trying nobly to stay awake and his head falls on his chest. You'll find his energy wasn't boundless at all. It had a bound to it and he's just about reached it. And a few minutes later, he'll be breathing heavily in his bed because he reached the bound of his energy. We talk about taking infinite pains. I insist that uh, anybody that writes for the little old Alliance Witness takes some pains with his writing. I don't demand infinite pains. Because infinite means, of course, it's limitless, it has no end, and I wouldn't expect anybody to continue on writing one piece forever and then not reach his goal. Well, these words can be used of created things because everything that's created has limits, everything has bounds, everything has an end. You can put a marker down somewhere and say, this is as far as I go. The richest man in all the United States, somewhere, somebody drives a stake down and says, now you stay on the other side. And even though he may own a yacht and two or three cars and several estates and uh, have bonds and uh, riches of all sorts, he can't cross over that line. That's a limit. That's a bound. The man over on the other side says, you stay across there. There, that's, that's, that's a fence limit. That's as far as you go. And the richest man in the world is limited. Another word we never can use about God is the word measureless. We, we can, it, can, it can be said, or I rather mean that we can't use about man. We can only use it about God, just as we can use the word unlimited and mean God, boundless and mean God, endless and mean God, measureless means God. And you never can apply it to any man because measure is the way that things account to themselves or account to intelligences for for themselves. They give account of themselves, and we call it measure. Well, measure, you know, describes limitations, describes perfections. A little boy stands up against the wall, and they make a mark on the, on the door, on the wall, and a year later, on his birthday, he stands up again. He's accounting to his parents for his growth. He's getting taller now than he was before. A woman steps on the scales, but why go into that? <laughs> and, uh, She's accounting to herself for that which is uh, limited. Thank God, it's limited, but... uh, Well, it's it's imperfect. Anything that is limited is imperfect. It's got to be, you know. And so you can't can't apply this to God because uh, these words... uh, Apply only to things contingent and relative. Measurement is, uh, is, belongs to things, uh, that are relative and, and contingent. And God, being self-contained and absolute, never can use these words about God. I wish that, uh, you know, lawyers, we kid the lawyers an awful lot about their use of words. Because they never come right out and say it. 
They, uh, they go around and hedge themselves in and uh, put in all sorts of modifiers, carefully fixing it so that if they should die, the next man can pick it up. Scientists do the same thing. That is why uh, we don't go into a drugstore and say, give me a bottle of that red stuff. Uh, they, they have a name for it. And then more than that, they have a symbol. And uh, they write, the doctors write it up in Latin so that it won't, won't die, won't change. Latin being a dead language doesn't change. English being a living language, you never know where it's going to be next week. Some beatnik gets a hold of it. <laughs> so uh, they never trust, they never trust these, these heavy things to, to, to fluid, changeable English. They put it in a dead language. Scientists do the same thing. So that year after year and century after century, everybody knows precisely what they're talking about. I wish we had a language of theology that was like that. And then I wish we had a law and a pope or somebody to enforce the law that would compel everybody to stay off the grass and let these words alone and not use them about people, not use them about chiffon pies, not use them about dresses and boyfriends, but leave them for the God to whom they belong. But we don't do it. Absolutely. We say he's absolutely charming. Well, why do we say that? Why don't we simply say that he's charming and let it go of that? We don't have to buttress everything with a lot of adjectives that belong to God, anyhow. And now, uh, let's look a bit how measure applies to created things. Weight, for instance. What is weight? Well, it's the gravitational pull uh, of matter, that's all. And uh, we we weigh so much because the gravity is, is laying a claim on us. It tugs away at us. It tugs about 142 pounds worth on me when ringing wet. And uh, I uh, I notice it. I notice it a little more now than he used to. I notice the hills are a little steeper and the steps are a little higher further. Weight, you know, that's gravitational pull. And then what's distance? Well, distance is what you measure space with and length is for extension in space, and liquid has a way of being measured, and energy can be measured, and sound, and light, and numbers have to do with plurality. Always because there's a limit to something, we measure. If it had no limit, nobody would try to measure it, you see. If 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 uh, the earth didn't weigh a certain amount and no more, nobody would ever try to weigh the earth. I've often wondered how they weigh the earth, and how they know how the thing, much the thing weighs. They figured out somehow or other, but if it was w w limitless and had no bounds to it, nobody would try to weigh it. Why try to weigh that which you, you never could find uh, any figures to, 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 to uh, indicate? So uh, weight and measurement and all those things are, are applied to, to matter and creatures and things. But when we come to God Almighty, remember always that God's outside of all of that. I don't know what this means to you at all, but this means this everything to me. This is what I rest down on. And I sing our God, our help in ages past. This is what I mean. I mean a God that has no bound, no limit, a God that has no weight, no measure, a God that has no dimension, the God that you can't deal with as you deal with people, a God that ri rises above it and is outside of it, and a God that... That, that contains all of this that we're talking about, but it is contained of nothing. Uh, this is the God we adore, our faithful and changeable friend, whose love is as great as his power and has neither limit nor end. Now, we sing that song, and yet nobody ever stops to consider that when you sing that song. Let's see if I can recall it now. I did there for a minute. This, this is the God we adore, our faithful and changeable friend. Faithfulness and immutability. There are two attributes. Whose love is as great as his power. Love and power, two other attributes. And no, neither limit nor end. I got my grammar straight that time. No, neither limit nor end. Well, neither limit nor end is two ways of saying one thing, that God is infinite. Now, there you have five of the attributes of God in that one stanza alone. And people sing it for a lifetime and never known that they're singing about the attributes of God and the being of God, never enters their mind at all. But it enters mine, and I want it to enter yours. If we want to save the Church of Christ from complete de de collapse in our day, we're going to have to go back to the grassroots and the foundation and begin to conceive of God the way the Bible declares him to be and nature confirms him to be, and human reason 
who would go along with and declare him to be. Now, uh, the words that I've been talking about here, weight and measure and distance and all the rest, I say, don't apply to God because they, they have to do with uh, things you can touch and weigh and measure and see and all the rest. They describe that which is imperfect. Uh, weight, you know, with the earth and distance to the sun and numbers of the stars and size of a mountain and the energy of lightning and all this. But when we come to God, God knows no degrees. I want you to hear that. Again, we have a negative. God knows no degrees. God has no degrees. People have degrees. Your head, your intellect has uh, degrees of, uh, of alertness and ability, and they've tried to weigh, weigh that and measure it. When I was in the army as a young fellow, 21 years of age, I took the old uh, IQ test they had then, and uh, I never found out where I rated. Maybe they're ashamed to tell me. But uh, they told me that I rated among the uh, the top 4%. That is, I was up among the up 96 to 100. Well, you know, it's taken me 40 years to get over that. Yeah, it's taken me that long to get over the fact that uh, I, I started out with a with a relatively high IQ. I think I would have been better off if they'd, if they'd just shaken their head and said, poor fellow, patted my head and started me off. Then I would have come out at least humble. But when you got, when you imagine you have a high IQ, it's very hard to get over it. If your child has a high IQ, never let him find it out. Cause you'd be an insufferable bore before he gets to be 15 years old. Well, we have a way of measuring our intelligence. I guess we do. And we certainly have a way of measuring other things. But when it comes to God, 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 God has no, uh, has no degrees of anything. You have a degree of intelligence. You have a degree of a sense of humor. You have a, a degree of musical ability. E e even I can hum nearer my God to thee in good weather. Uh, but uh, my degree of music is certainly not very high. I have a, an appreciative ear and, and a good soul for music, but I never know whether one of them off pitch. My daughter used to kid me and say that I was fishing for the, for the pitch, you know, and I was fishing around and never got it, and never, nothing ever came up but the empty hook. But there are degrees of musical ability, and there are degrees of artistic ability. And most anybody can uh, paint a horse, you know, and if he tells them what it is. But it takes a real artist with a high degree of, uh, of artistic ability to paint so anybody will know what it is or buy it, particularly. But when we come to God, God has no degrees. God isn't better at one thing than he is at another thing. Do you ever think about that? God hasn't any more love than he has mercy because he has an infinite amount of both. And to use the word amount is to fall back on the weakness of human language because God doesn't deal in amounts. God just is and that's all and you can't say God has an amount of anything because that would be saying he had a degree which I am saying he doesn't have. God has no degrees, he has no size, therefore God isn't bigger or smaller, God is just God. And uh, God has no degree uh, of intelligence. God, being omniscient, knows all that there is, and being all-wise and all-knowing, uh, has all wisdom and all knowledge, all, I say. And uh, you, it's not so much, but all. Angels have a limited amount of knowledge, I suppose. They certainly have more knowledge than we have. I would suppose they do, because it says that they are wise, and it tells about one who happened to be a cherub who was very perfect in wisdom. He used that awful word perfect there. God made him so near like himself in his wisdom that they could use the, the word uh, perfect with certain r r sense of relative sense about uh, the cherub, cherub that uh, surrounded the throne or that, uh, that uh, covered the throne, moved around it to protect it. So, uh, God has no limits. Now, this sounds awfully dull, and I suppose you wish I'd stayed up in Canada. But I'm having a good time. There's one nice thing about my preaching. It's this. If nobody else enjoys it, I'm having a whale of a time. I really am. I, I like it. I, I, I don't like to hear it, you know. I wouldn't listen to a tape of my own preaching at all if I can get out of it. I've had to listen to a few, but they're awful. My nose, my nose, not nasal, you got a nasal twang, you sound like Harry Truman at his worst. <laughs> and uh, I hate to hear myself. 
It isn't that I think I'm a good preacher, brother. It's just that I'm preaching about wonderful things, that's all. It's just that I'm talking about that which, uh, than which there is nothing more wonderful. I'm talking about God, the triune God, the infinite God, our Father which art in heaven, and the God who dwells in light that no man can approach unto, and yet the God who came so near that he was born of the womb of a virgin. The God who is so infinitely transcendent that the creatures there before the throne veil their faces and cry, holy, 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 and yet a God who could eat fish and drink milk and wine beside the Sea of Galilee along with his smelly disciples, smelling of the sea and of fish and of the fish nets. So that is the God we adore, our, our, our gracious, unchangeable friend. And that's the one I'm talking about. That's why I say I'm having a good time whether anybody else is or not. One poet said, One God, one majesty, there is no God but the unbounded, unextended unity. You know, you can get in trouble easy. I, I always had a sort of a flair for getting in trouble. And no matter what innocent, nice thing I say, somebody writes me a letter and asks, How come? And uh, I quoted this, uh, one God, one majesty, there is no God but the unbounded, unextended unity, and a few other stanzas of the same hymn one time. A fellow wrote in and told me that I, I was guilty of pantheism and uh, that a whole lot of other things. Pantheism. I don't even know what the word means, you know. I, <laughs> I, I'm not a pantheist. Pantheist is somebody that believes God is everything or that everything is God and that God is composed of trees and rocks and seas and mountains and people and archangels and cattle and uh, leaves and worms and all things that are, add that up and you have God. That's old maidism, you know, the doctrine of the pantheist, uh, badly wrung out and watered down and uh, dehydrated, and uh, we have old maidism of the day. But uh, I don't believe in that. I believe that God's infinitely transcendent above everything that he has ever made and all things that he has made, and that that God has no no degrees, that you can't say that, that uh, God has weight because weight belongs to matter and has to do with gravitational pull, and uh, what kind of fix would God be in if he was subject to gravitational pull? If the great God Almighty moving among the heavenly bodies were to be caught in the gravitational pull of one be of one body or another body, it's ridiculous. You can't even think about it. God has yields to no gravitational tug or pull. So uh, we we think of God as being infinite, and uh, what He is, therefore, He is without limit and without bound. Now, if there were any point that God didn't go beyond, that would be the limit of God. And if God had a limit somewhere, then God would be imperfect. He wouldn't be enough, you see. The reason you don't have enough money is because you count and count and count and count, and then you come to the end, and there ain't any more. And you don't count anymore. You've reached the limit. It isn't enough. It's an imperfect uh, financial status. Well, you can't apply this, that, imperfection to God Almighty. There's not nowhere where you can say, now God is this intelligent, but here we drive a stake. God overflows all of your stake and reaches out and flows beyond all the bounds of all human thought or all angelic thought or seraphic thought. There is no creature that can think or dream or imagine how infinitely knowing God is. So what he is and all that he is, he is without limit or bound. And there's no point or limit anywhere where uh, God is now, where you say this is as far as God goes. Now, uh, what does this mean to us? You're going to tuck that away in your head and uh, try someday to repeat it uh, to somebody? Or uh, is it going to mean something to us? I hope it'll mean something. What does it mean? Well, it means, for instance, that God's love is infinite. That uh, God loves me. I don't think I'll preach on the love of God this time. Uh, possibly get around to it, but maybe not. And if I don't, I'll anticipate myself and say this much, that the love of God has no limit. See, human love has a limit. A woman can love a man to the point where she would uh, destroy herself for him, and yet he can hack away at that, come home drunk and beat the children and kick the dog and curse her and keep doing it and keep doing it and desert her and come back and do it over again until finally, little by little, he destroys it because it has a limit. It has an end to it, and he reaches the end, and many a man has reached the end. 
Many a man's living now with a wife who's the end of whose love he's reached long ago. She had a great sea of it, but it was all used up on the beast. He was too much of a beast, so it's all used up. Or a mother has great love for her child, and she can love that child with what seems infinite love, but because it's not infinite, it can perish. The child can sin away uh, her love until finally he has brought her to her knees in tottering helplessness, and what little love is left dies within her bosom. I suppose that doesn't happen often, for a mother's love is a mighty tough thing, but it's not infinite, and therefore it has a limit to it. Or the mother can die, and with her dies her love. But uh, the immortal God who cannot die, cannot we cannot lose his love by his death, and we cannot lose his love by our using it up, because it's infinite. It has no degrees, can't run the meter up on God's love and look at the dial and say, well, God has this much love. God has all the love there is, brother. And you can't measure it. There's no dial that can, that can mark it nor express it. Uh, God's love is as infinite as God is. There's no bound anywhere. And when it says, God so loved the world, the little word so there is bigger than the longest word in theology. For it's an infinite word. It may, simply means that, uh, that God's love was infinite and God's love is still infinite. Yea, I have loved you with an everlasting love, said God. And not only God's love is infinite, but God's grace is infinite. Did you ever stop to think about that? Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Now, that doesn't mean simply that man had so much sin and God had uh, quite a little bit more grace. As though you owed a hundred dollars and uh, you were able to get a hold of two hundred. And you could tuck the other hundred away in your wallet and say, thank God I not only had enough, but I had more than enough. It isn't as though you needed a hundred dollars and knew where you could get a hundred. It is that there is no limit to the grace of God. God's grace is boundless. It's not like the sea. We say it's as boundless as the sea, but the sea isn't boundless. You know, we get all confused in our language. We sing boundless as the sea. And yet you can go down here to Coney Island and walk out and touch the bound of the sea. Did you ever think of that? The sea, the bound of the sea, has sand around it and seashells and dead fish and people in the summertime. And uh, therefore, we, uh, we, we talk about a boundless sea. We stand on the shore of the sea and talk about it being boundless. How inconsistent can we get? So likening God to a sea isn't quite what it ought to be. Because the sea has bounds and the sea has depth. But there is no bound and no depth to the love of God. No height, no limit anywhere to the grace of God. God's grace abounds much more. And those two little words, much more. Each of them have four letters in them in English. Much more. And that means infinite, for that's what it is, talking about the love of God. You ever stop to think about the sin of man? But no matter how much the sin of man was, the grace of God being infinite could uh, take care of the whole thing. I have a little song that I think a great deal of. I'm not going to sing it, but I'm going to quote a stanza or two of it. It goes like this. Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are my glorious dress. Knees uh, and mutuals, red with joy shall I lift up my head. I said I was going to quote it, but I got three lines. Well, there's a stanza in that, uh, Vincent Torf wrote that, you know, and Wesley translated it. There's a, there's a stanza in that that I believe, and uh, I like to sing it. Somebody suggested I didn't sing since I came here to the, to the, to the campus. That's what you think that I don't sing. I don't know whether they heard me up there or not, but I, I, I don't spend as much time asking God for things as I used to. I used to have a long grocery list, and I took it to God every so often. And we went over it together, you know, at least I went over it, and I hope God was going over it with me, about the things that I wanted. And I still believe God hears for specific things. And if you're in trouble, don't let me prevent you from going to God with a specific trouble or a specific need. But I think that that ought to be, that ought to taper off and become mighty small in our lives as we go along. And I think worship ought to take its place. I believe that a Bible and a hymn book's just about all a Christian needs, and if she accepts, of course, the Alliance Witness, but 
I think that a Bible and a hymn book is just about all a Christian. I think a Christian can get along pretty well. If I were to be, uh, now here it comes, this old cliche about being uh, cast up on a desert island, what two books would I want? I'd want a good hymn book, not, not, not a tabernacle hymn number two, a good hymn book. I would want a good hymn book and a good Bible. A King James translation, if I could not get, uh, if I could uh, just have one, and then I would want as many others as I could in order to check on the King James translators. But the Bible and the hymn book is just about all a man needs, because uh, God Almighty inspired the Bible, and then in a lesser degree he inspired certain men to take truths from the Bible and set them to music, or at least make put them into meter, and so we have hymns. And I, I worship more than I used to. Well, what, where did I get over onto that? Well, what I was talking about was singing hymns. And uh, I said that uh, there's uh, one stanza in that hymn that runs like this. Lord, I believe we're sinners more than sands upon the ocean shore. Thou hast for all a ransom paid, for all a full atonement made. Now, there is a... A certain book I have, which uh, belongs to a group that are strongly uh, Calvinistic, as some of you are, and uh, they don't believe that Jesus died for everybody. They think he died for the elect, and they call it particular atonement, a limited atonement. And uh, it made me smile in a sour kind of a way one time, and running over their hymn book, I found out they left out that verse. Lord, I believe we're sinners more than sands upon the ocean shore. Thou hast for all a ransom paid, for all a full atonement made. They couldn't quite swallow that, so they just edited that one out. The rest of the hymn was all right, but they couldn't quite swallow the idea that Jesus Christ made atonement for all the human race. Well, how perfectly easy it would be for Jesus to make atonement for all the human race. Because if you were to take all the human beings that are now alive, add to them all the human beings that ever have lived in the world back to Adam, add to that all the human beings that ever will live until people stop reproducing their kind, if they ever do in the ages to come, if you were to take the whole human race, all human beings, and add up all the sins they committed, all of their sins, at the bottom, you'd still be able to put it down in figures. You'd find that the whole human race, sinning 24 hours a day for 6,000 years, still didn't sin infinitely. Their sins were, were, were numberless in that I can't number them and you can't number them, number them, but they were not infinite because they have a bound. But Jesus Christ, when he died on a cross, poured out blood of infinite value so that Jesus Christ can, without any strain, perfectly atone for all the human race without trying. When he died for anybody, he died for all bodies because, and all persons because he could do it. He's the infinite God. Far be it from me to limit the Almighty by saying that he died only for certain ones. 